Hello and uh, welcome to AC 3.2 of Unit 4 of uh, WJEC Criminology Level 3 Qualification. And this assessment component is entitled Describe the Contribution of Agencies to Achieving Social Control. Now, what I've done with this, I've split it up into three separate PowerPoints. And in this one, I'm going to look at a specific area of social control used by agencies, which is environmental design. So this PowerPoint covers AC 3.2, but only the section on environmental design. So without further ado, let's make a start. So as I said, uh, this AC is looking at how different agencies achieve social control, the various ways they do it. In this PowerPoint, we're going to con uh, concentrate on environmental design. So basically, this is the way that architects, planners and councils design the environment we live in in order to reduce crime. So criminologists argue that the built environment can affect crime in two ways. So the makeup of environment can affect crime. So it has an influence on potential offenders. It either presents them with opportunities to commit crime or it doesn't present them with opportunities to commit crime, depending on the environment. And that then affects people's ability to exercise control over their surroundings. So if people have control over their surroundings, crime is going to be less likely because people are in control, they're on the lookout, etc., etc. So two key things that are linked to this concept of environmental design. So what these criminologists are saying is that agencies such as councils, architects, planners, etc., can design crime out by changing the physical layout of an area. So the first real work done on this was by the architect Oscar Newman. He argued that you have spaces that are either defensible or indefensible. So some spaces are defensible, some are not. Indefensible spaces are where crime is more likely to occur. Newman calls these confused areas of public space. Examples are things like anonymous walkways, stairwells. They belong to no one and are observed by no one and therefore are more likely to see crime committed in those areas. Newman um, did a study of high rise blocks in New York and found that 55 percent of all crimes were committed in public spaces such as hallways, lifts, stairwells and lobbies. And the reason he said this happened is because no one felt that they owned those areas. So ownership is key in this concept of environmental design. When Newman talked about defensible spaces, he, would talk, he was talking about areas that have got clear boundaries. So it's really obvious who should be there and who shouldn't be there. And Newman argued that defensible spaces have got low crime rates because they have four key features. They've got this idea of territoriality. The environment encourages a sense of ownership among residents. The feeling it's their territory, they control it. So to give you an example, cul-de-sacs, you know, um, dead end streets project a private image, encourage a sense of community because no one's going to be walking through a cul-de-sac. You, you only go into a cul-de-sac to deliver something, to visit someone or if you live there. So you've got this idea of ownership with people know each other in the area and identify strangers. Therefore, it's harder for a criminal to um, get up to no good in those sort of areas where people have a sense of ownership of the area they're in. He stressed the importance of natural surveillance. In other words, buildings which have um, easily viewed entrance lobbies, street level windows, so that residents can identify and observe strangers. So there's lots of stuff going on in the street. Windows are low to the ground, they're not obscured, that sort of thing. He also talked about a safe image. He said building design should give the impression of a safe neighbourhood where residents look after one another. If you have a negative image, the area is going to be targeted by offenders. And finally, he talked about having a safe location. So neighbourhoods that are located in the middle of a wider crime free area become insulated from the outside world. It's like a moat of safety around them. 
So territoriality, natural surveillance, a safe image and a safe location are what Newman thought would give you a relatively crime-free environment. Now Newman's thoughts then lead on to crime prevention through environmental design. This has the acronym SEPTED and you will need to know about SEPTED for the exam. There's always a question on it. So crime prevention through environmental design is a crime prevention theory which focuses on tactical design and the effective use of the built environment. And exponents of SEPTED argue that when it's applied successfully, it reduces both crime and also the fear of crime. So as stated, the main objective of SEPTED is to reduce and remove the opportunity for crime to occur in an environment and promote positive interaction with the space by legitimate users. So it's building on Newman's ideas. So here you have a link to a, uh, a police um, information video from the US talking about SEPTED and how to improve areas. And of course, the key thing with SEPTED here is it's a proactive model, not a reactive model. So it's something you do prior to building stuff or after you built something, adding stuff to it. So you know, here's, here's a SEPTED example here, a high risk, you know, there's no SEPTED measures here, but here we can see a gate's been installed, fencing, so you've got territoriality, shrubs before windows, um, et cetera, et cetera landscaping features, creating obstacles for people to get through. And we'll talk about this as we go through this PowerPoint. So SEPTED principles are based on anticipating the thought processes of a potential offender. So very much linked to some of the concepts within right realism and rational choice theory. Um, the idea that criminals weigh up the pros and cons before they commit a crime. So SEPTED is making those cons higher as opposed to the pros. Um, so we're creating an environment that discourage, discourages criminals from following through on crime. So they may go into an area looking to steal something. They look around the area and realize mm, it's too much of a risk. I've used my rational choice theory. I'm not gonna follow through on my intention to commit a crime. This area is too well protected. So it's got the added advantage, SEPTED, of creating a sense of security and well-being among employees, if it's in a workplace, or tenants, if it's in, um, if it's in a, 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 a non-work area. And when SEPTED's put into practice, the resulting environment, including the building and its surroundings, will, in, I, in ideal situations, discourage or impede criminal behavior, and at the same time, encourage honest citizens to keep a watchful eye over their space. So again, for, SEPTED has four key elements. I think you need to know these. They are linked to Newman's ideas. So there's some crossover here. Here they are explained here, but I'm gonna go through all four of them with you in the next few slides. And these four uh, elements are natural surveillance, natural access control, territorial reinforcement and maintenance. And as I said, I'm gonna deal with these in the next few slides. So let's start with natural surveillance. So SEPTED argues that criminals don't like to be seen or recognized, so they're gonna choose situations where they can hide and easily escape. So natural surveillance involves keeping areas well lit, so it's harder for the criminals to hide. So SEPTED would argue that entrances should be bright at all times. You've got a clear line of sight from both inside and outside. So here, uh, if we look at this house, bushes over the windows, etc., isn't uh, giving you natural surveillance. After SEPTED, clear those windows so you can clearly see, install a light so you can clearly see. Uh, you eliminate hiding spots within natural surveillance. So cutting down hedges, removing trees and bushes, fences, having fences, large bins, etc. Anything that creates a blind spot or a hiding place is, is discouraged under SEPTED. Pl um, they would encourage planting low thorny hedges around windows because they don't obstruct the view in and out and they're not a comfortable place to hide. So there's your before, there's your after, thorny hedges, but they're not obscuring the window. And obviously um, in areas where you don't have natural sight lines, Ted would advocate the use of CCTV. Obviously the last thing a criminal wants to see when they enter a building is their own face on a security monitor. So the potential offender, if they see their face on the TV as they walk into the store, they don't like to be watched and they're less likely to commit a crime. So SEPTED would argue. 
natural access control is all about taking control away from the criminals. Criminals like to feel they're in control, but you can deny that sense of control by clearly marking the approaches to buildings and properties and channeling visitors into a defined area. Now, maze entrances in public lobbies such as these, uh, a good example of natural access control, um, they cut off straight line access to a potential target, uh, such as a bank teller or a cashier. Tension barriers that have to be jumped or navigated around obviously discourage criminals. Likewise, curbing and landscaping, such as this, directs automobile and foot traffic into a controlled visible area and they can also prevent access to an area. So <clears throat> increasingly in town centres you see planting, bollards, you know, big uh, metal bollards. This stops people driving cars into areas, uh, prevents access, um, etc. and cuts down on crime. Now you might have seen in the front of um, <coughs> my PowerPoint um, this um, uh, picture of the Emirates Stadium. Uh, this is here because this is actually an example of septed and natural access control. So here we've got a great big concrete, um, the, uh, in concrete the letters of Arsenal by um, the Emirates Stadium. Behind, behind here is where all the fans congregate and move in and this is a deliberate attempt to uh, stop natural access. We've um, had recent spates over the past few years of terrorists getting into vans and lorries and driving into crowds. This prevents anything like that happening because the crowds are channeled behind the great big concrete sign for Arsenal. And if you're a terrorist, you're trying to drive a lorry into a crowd, all that's going to happen is you're going to hit this concrete and you're going to kill yourself and not the crowd. So that actually is a deliberate natural access control move put in by the designers of the stadium. When we get to territorial reinforcement, this is all about creating a clear distinction between public and private property. So a legitimate occupant will have a sense of ownership and will notice and even challenge people who don't belong. Intruders, on the other hand, are going to have a harder time blending in. So when we talk about territorial reinforcement, it's things like making sure receptionists have clear sight lines to all entrances, as well as the ability to quite quickly and discreetly call for help. Um, a panic button that calls a central station or signals for help via an alarm light in a separate building of, the, of, of part of the building would work well as well. So, you know, this would be a perfect example of a clear sight line, a long walk through. So if there was any troublemaker coming through, you'd have plenty of time to ring the alarm bell before anything happens. Making sure security signage is clearly visible at all entrances. You know, it, it's really obvious that if the signage is up and then you go against that sign, you are where you shouldn't be. And other things such like such as having a visitor badging system um, is another example of septed and territorial reinforcement, making sure that visitors are properly escorted. That way, employees get the feeling that their workspace is their space and um, intruders are immediately put on the defensive. And then we move through finally to maintenance. And this is the related to broken windows theory, the idea that one broken window will entice vandals to break another. A vandalised area will then become more inviting to higher levels of crime, etc, etc. And so obviously property should be well maintained as a matter of safety as well as pride. So that's things like target hardening. It's another element often mentioned in connection with SEPTED. It simply means make a building more difficult to forcibly enter. So use deadbolts, protective window films, uh, plate glass, you know, is used in shops with a window film over it, it'll stop a sledgehammer. So that's your example of maintenance and target hardening will link into that. And as I mentioned previously, SEPTO has really clear links to right realist theories and ideas such as rational choice theory and of course situational crime prevention which is closely linked in with SEPTO. Now, how was this moved into the UK? Well, this lady here, Alice Coleman, adopted a similar approach to Newman in the UK. She analysed 4,099 blocks of flats in two London boroughs. She concluded, as a result of findings, that poor design of many blocks produced higher rates of crime and antisocial behaviour. And she uh, stressed three design features that encouraged crime. Um, 
An anonymity was one, lack of surveillance, which links through to SEPTED, and easy escapes. So her recommendations included no more blocks of flats should be built. She didn't like that. Each existing block should have its own garden or private space so that residents looked after it, so they've got a sense of ownership, a sense of territoriality. She recommended that overhead walkways should be removed because they obstruct surveillance. And these ideas were really influential with planners and have led to attempts to design crying out. So to give you some examples, always good to be, good to be able to cite some examples here. On the Lisson Green Estate in West London, the removal of overhead walkways led to a 50% reduction in crime. Some police forces now employ architectural liaison officers to build in crime prevention features at the design stage for new buildings. And the Secured by Design SBD Kite Mark Scheme, which is used by the building industry in the UK, indicates that a new building meets these crime prevention standards. And Home Office research has shown a 30% lower burglary rate in SBD houses. So there's lots of evidence that SEPTED does work. You can design out crime. Now, the syllabus asks us to look at specific examples um, of SEPTED. And one of these examples is gated lanes. Now, um, alley gates or gated lanes, they're lockable gates that are installed to prevent access to alleyways, such as those which run along the rear of older style terraced housing in the UK. So here, I can't remember where this photo is from, but if you, old style terraced housing built in the, at the turn of the century, what you used to have was, there's the terrace, back to back terraces, and down the middle would be your back gardens and an, an alleyway that would run um, down the side. At the same time, if I lived here and I wanted to get to here, the problem is I've got to go all the way around, go around there. But actually what we've got between these houses, you can see little alleys which allow you to cut through and uh, get to places quicker. OK, so that's what we're talking about. So the problem you have is lots of little dark alleyways, lots of little corners, not maintained, not owned. If there's no gates anyone can start to use them. So alley gates, putting a gate in on these alleys, alleys prevents crime, it is argued. So alley gates are a burglary prevention tool, also prevents other crimes such as littering, antisocial behaviour, by preventing access to alleys by non-residents and better controlling the space. Now, alley gates are made of iron or steel, they're bespoke in relation to the requirements and specific, uh, specifications of the individual alley, and the residents of the homes adjacent to the gate alley are then left to operate the gates and they're either given a key or a key code combination. And here's a link to Wales Online, which talks about how gated alleys are affecting streets and changing the crime rate. So you can have a look at that at your leisure. Now, obviously they create a physical barrier. So it makes it difficult for the criminal to climb over or crawl under. It decreases crime by increasing the effort required by offenders to commit burglary and other crimes. Think of that rational choice theory again. And obviously residents become responsible for the gates and because the residents are controlling access to them, that's increasing guardianship, increasing surveillance, increasing this idea of territoriality and so reducing crime. And offenders could also no longer use the excuse they didn't realise access was prohibited because there's a gate there and if they haven't got the key of the combination, they're clearly trespassing. So the idea is that by having a, an alley gate, you decrease this idea of broken windows by gating the alleys and creating orderly and clean spaces. It reduces the attractiveness of the area to offenders and it limits the items which are possible to be removed during offences. So for instance, if I was going to um, sneak over a gate and alley and then try and make off with a huge uh, flat screen TV, I would struggle to get that over the gate. So. Um, certain types of burglary are going to be made harder by the fact you've got a gate there. But there are always issues. One way in which alley gates may act actually to increase crime is by reducing guardianship. So some people argue if you gate your alleys, that reduces their usage by legitimate individuals such as residents, because actually it becomes a faff to use them. 
So guardianship and natural surveillance actually decrease as opposed to increase. Um, also, it doesn't work if your criminals are resident within the gated area. Uh, definitely doesn't. So there's a big downside to them. Um, the neighbourhood may have an effect on um, an impact upon effectiveness. You know, communities with a high turnover of residents may mean that many people have access to keys or key codes without necessarily having an investment in the area. So if you've got, you know, sometimes in these areas which terrace houses tend to be in the poorer areas, which tend to be rented to things like students, etc., and students have a high turnover, so they're not really bothered how clean their back alley is because they're not really living in the house for much more than a year. And so the neighbourhood can have, um, creates an issue here. Um, and also the gates are expensive, you know, they're about on average 70, 728 pounds each and that costs a lot of money for the council to put them in. Um, and also, you know, physical environment is important. You know, um, alley gates can sometimes create an environment that appears to be uncared for, you know, prevents refuse collection. Um, so you've got to be really carefully thinking about your design when you are installing alley gates. So something to think about there. So overall, let's try and sum up SEPTED. There have been some criticisms of SEPTED. The stuff I've given you so far appears to be pretty good, but some people argue that SEPTED focuses on defence from outsiders who come into the area to offend, but obviously insiders commit crime too, such as domestic violence. So I'm going to stop that. Um, SEPTED can't explain offences that don't involve physical intrusion into a neighbourhood, such as cybercrime, fraud and white collar corporate crime. Well, that's fairly obvious. Um, cul-de-sacs, which um, Newman advocated the strength of, they are defensible spaces, but they might not actually be defended. For example, you know, if the residents are out all day, there's no surveillance there. So this then highlights how social factors such as employment patterns could interact with environmental factors. You have a perfectly good cul-de-sac, but if everyone's out working during the daytime, then no one's watching, and actually, it's actually easier to burgle. Um, and of course, some housing estates, going to some sociological theories of crime now, have high crime rates because of the council's housing allocation policies, rather than because of their design. Some councils place problem families with a history of antisocial behavior on sink estates. So you put all the problem families in together and create a sink estate. That's not design, that's the people that are in it. And therefore an area's reputation can cause a high, high crime rate. Now if uh, police believe that an estate is crime ridden, they're going to patrol it more. That means they're going to be more arrests, which means there's going to be a higher crime rate. And that means the estate's going to have an even worse reputation. So it's not all good, Septed. So our final piece of environmental design brings us on to prison design. So obviously that can impact on crime and social control within the context of a prison. So we've seen this before, but we'll mention it again, the panopticon, the all seeing shape. Uh, Michael Foucault argues that in a modern society, we're increasingly controlled by surveillance. And he illustrated this through a description of prison design known as the panopticon. So the concept of the design is to allow an observer, usually stationed in the middle of these guard towers, to view all prisoners without the prisoners being able to tell if they're being watched. Now, the way it works, you have the tower at the centre from which it's possible for the guards, um, sorry, for the guards to see each cell in which a prisoner is kept because the cells are on the outside. Prisoners can be seen, but cannot see the guards or communicate with them or their fellow inmates because they have um, one way mirror glass on the cell doors. So the prisoners don't know whether they're being watched or not, or whether they're being not watched or not at any given moment. So Foucault argues, therefore, they behave just in case. So surveillance turns into effectively self surveillance. The guards have no need to discipline the prisoners. Actually, the prisoners are disciplining themselves. <coughs> and Foucault's theory can be linked to uh, today's use of um, CCTV cameras, their impact on our behaviour. Um, no, no panoptical prisons being used at the moment, to my knowledge, in the world today. There were a few used in America, but they're now not used anymore. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, 
YouTube clip about the Panopticon and CCTV and about being watched within society, which you can look at at your leisure. So prison design has evolved through the ages as technology has progressed and attitudes to the treatment of prisoners has changed. So we've got designs such as the American Supermax jails. These are the most secure levels of custody. And in Supermax jail, the objective is to provide long term segregated housing for prisoners who represents the highest security risk, including those who are a threat to national and international security. For example, you can have a look at Florence, Colorado, which holds the most notorious American terrorists and murderers in solitary confinement. Prison houses 360 inmates in ultra high security. Now, Supermax prisoners, prisons cost three times nearly three times more to build and operate the traditional maximum security prisons but you can see what they're like by clicking on that youtube link there which gives you how to survive a supermax prison personally i would not want to spend time in there 23 hours a day on your own in a cell but you have a look at it and see what you think so as i said high tech and supermax prisons are incredibly expensive to build this is why many countries continue to keep prisoners in old style prisoners such as devon dartmoor prison which was um, built in um, between 1806 and 1809 to house prisoners from the napoleonic war it's supposed to close in 2023 although it doesn't look like it's going to uh, the newest prison in britain is uh, Berwyn in Wales in Wrexham holds 2016 prisoners open 2017 cost 25 uh, 250 million to build there it is there's a picture of the cell and if you go here to BBC News in Wales uh, there's an article about it and you can click on a little clip that uh, takes you around it so have a look at that um, we've looked at Bastoy prison before in Norway it's been called the Norwegian prison that works, as well as the world's nicest prison. Uh, Bastoy prison is on an island in a fjord. Inmates live communally in comfortable homes. Each man has his own room, shares the kitchen, other facilities with other inmates. A meal a day is provided for them. Any other food has to be bought from the local supermarket and prepared by the prisoners themselves. And they receive an, um, an allowance of around $90 uh, dollars a month. They can earn roughly $80 a day uh, on a variety of jobs that include growing food, looking after horses, repairing bikes, doing woodwork, maintaining the facilities on the island. And every inmate is offered high quality education and training programmes to increase their skills. It's on an island, as I said, one square mile in size, hosts 115 inmates with a staff of 69 prison officers. One, only five employees remain on the island overnight. And in their free time, inmates have the opportunity to visit the church, school or library, engage in leisure facilities, horse riding, fishing, tennis. All guards have received three years training compared to perhaps six months in the US and resemble social workers more than prison officers. If you want to have a look at that, there's the clip there. And uh, their recidivism rate is incredibly low after being in Bastoy prison. And finally, you can have a look um, at another Norwegian prison, Halden prison, which has been specifically designed to achieve social control. So again, again, um, have a look at that. And you can have the do that by looking at these two links. First link looks at how the prison was designed and why. And the second follows a reporter as she goes inside and meets the guards and inmates. So have a look at that and think about how prison design affects the behaviour of the inmates and the guards and whether it leads to control or not. And I shall see you at my next PowerPoint. Take care. Goodbye.